So we're absolutely delighted to have Richard Howe here with us today. Richard Howe is the founder of the Stock Spinoff Investing Newsletter and head of research at Better Way. Previously, Mr. Howe was Senior Vice President at City Private Bank, and prior to that, he was an Equity Research Associate at Ian Vance, assisting primarily with researching large cap healthcare, software and internet, and financial services equities. Mr. Howe graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Trinity College Hartford. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Howe. Thank you so much for, for having me. This is, this is fun. Excellent. So let's get started with your uh, introduction. Okay. Yeah. So of course. So um, I, you know, I'm here to uh, to cover the spinoff world. Um, so I, um, I, uh, I, I guess you covered my background, but just starting out where I, you know, started my career. I uh, started at Eaton Vance, which was a mutual fund manager, and we were mainly um, trying to pick the best large cap stocks. Uh, whether it's Apple or Google or um, you know Netflix, eventually IPO while I was at at, at Eaton Vance, and it was a great place to to start my career and to learn. Um, but it was I realized it was a really hard game to play. Um, just picking large cap stocks, there there are some uh, professionals that are really good at it, but there are a lot of really smart folks, graduates from Brown and other impressive universities, who are incredibly smart and work incredibly hard and are always looking uh, for mispriced securities. And so um, I, I, I was kind of, you know, I just wanted to find, I guess, a less competitive area of the market uh, where it would be a little bit easier to, to kind of outperform. And so that's what really drew me to stock spinoffs and special situations. I read uh, a book by Joel Greenblatt called You Can Be a Stock Market Genius. And it's if you haven't read that book, I would recommend reading the book. It's it's definitely, uh, I'd say it's my favorite. It's definitely one of my favorites. But um, Joel just talks about how he managed Gotham, uh, Gotham Capital and generated about 50% returns for about a decade, decade before he shut the fund down and, and just managed his own money. Um, and a big way that he did it was investing in spinoffs. And he just, uh, the, the book that he wrote, it's very similar to uh, Peter Lynch's style, like one up on Wall Street, very easily approachable, uh, no highfalutin finance talk, just explained the investment case for some of his um, profitable investments and very easy to understand language. And so that was kind of eye-opening to me that it didn't necessarily have to be rocket science. And then, um, you know, one thing that really resonated with me, and I can I can uh, take a step back and, and des describe what exactly a spinoff um, is, is that um, spinoffs are, are really attractive because oftentimes uh, they're just being indiscriminately sold uh, by investors who have received the shares of the spinoff because they own the parent company. And, uh, and have really no reason, no interest in owning the spinoff. And so if you can be in a situation where you know more about a security or an asset than the seller, that's usually a good place to be. And so that's um, one of the reasons why um, I, you know, I find investing in spinoffs and other special situations um, so, so interesting. Maybe I'll just you know, take a step back and talk about what exactly spinoffs are um, and kind of the mechanics of spinoffs. And then I'm happy to expand on really anything or, or answer any questions. Um, so basically, a sp stock spinoff is when a public company uh, breaks up into two or more um, public companies. So a good example is United Technologies. So United Technologies was a big conglomerate, a very well-run conglomerate in 20, uh, 2020. They spun off their elevator business, Otis, and they spun off their air conditioning um, business, Carrier. So if you were a shareholder, of United Technologies in March of, of 2020, which was an interesting time in the market. Um, you know, one day you would own, uh, you know, your, your pro rata shares of United Technology. The next you own, you still own shares in United Technology, which was subsequently named, uh, renamed to Raytheon, but you also own shares in Otis, a pure play elevator manufacturer and servicer, and also carrier and air conditioner um, and other um, HVAC, uh, HVAC uh, manufacturing company. And so, um, you know, it's essentially when a, when a public company breaks up into two or more public companies, um, in the case of United Technologies, the company broke up into three different um, individual companies, but, you know, oftentimes it'll be one company spinning off um, another company. And so that is, you know, that is exactly what a spinoff is. 
Um, why are they interesting? I uh, touched on it a little bit before, but uh, they're interesting. Uh, they tend to be mispriced. So, you know, historically, if you had invested in a basket of spinoffs, you know, you tend to do quite well. Of course, the market is efficient and people know that spinoffs uh, can be profitable investments. And so there's definitely more people looking at spinoffs um, than before, um, definitely uh, partly because of so many other people have read Joel Greenblatt's book. And so I don't think it's quite as easy as it maybe once was um, to just own the entire basket of spinoffs and, and outperform the market. Um, you definitely can. But the thing that's um, nice about spinoffs is that uh, basically when a spinoff is going to, or when a spinoff is going to be, is going to begin trading, it files basically an information statement ahead of the spinoff. And it's kind of the equivalent of an S1 if a company were to, to IPO, to go public that way. But essentially you're going to get to know or learn all the important information about that spinoff, you're going to um, be able to understand, you know, revenue and margin profile, um, the capitalization, um, management incentives. And so what you can do and what I specialize in is I pretty much, you know, try to do my work ahead of time, get a sense of what this spinoff is going to be worth, whether it's a company that I would necessarily want to own at the right price. And then after that, um, especially if it's a, if it's a parent company um, that has a big market cap and it looks like the spinoff is going to be a small market cap. Uh, oftentimes there, that'll be a great setup for indiscriminate selling pressure. So you can essentially, you know, do your work all ahead of time and then wait to see um, the stock spinoff begin trading. Sometimes it drops like a rock and those are, you know, those are the best situations when you can, you know, you can, you can buy a lot on the way down. Um, and sometimes, you know, they don't sell off as much as you would, you would expect them to. Um, but I guess maybe before I open it up for questions or just pause briefly, um, I just want to cover why there is, there generally is indiscriminate selling pressure with spinoffs. So um, say you're a large cap portfolio manager, I'll give it a recent example and you're based in the UK and you own a company called Prudential. Um, this is an insurance company, but also an asset management uh, company that has, uh, you know, business in the United Kingdom, but also in Asia. So, you know, you own this 50 billion market cap company um, and you're happy with your position. It's a good business. It's well run. Um, one day you're going to, you know, wake up, come into the office and for, every, for all 40 shares of uh, Prudential that you own, you're going to own one share of a new company, a new spinoff called Jackson Financial, which, was a, which is a U.S. company. So this is a recent transaction that took place. So, you know, you, for every 40 shares that you own, you own one share. So it's a very tiny position for you. Um, not only that, but you, your mandate is probably to invest in large cap stocks like Prudential is, you know, 40, 50 billion market cap plus. Um, this company, Jackson Financial, when it was spun out, only had about a 1 billion to 2 billion market cap. And so it probably wasn't even in your mandate if you were a large cap, you know, portfolio manager in the UK. And so the, the easiest thing to do, as opposed to do a bunch of work to try to understand if you want to own Jackson Financial, is just to sell it. And so um, it's not a material position for you. You just sell it. You don't really care what price you get out at uh, because you, you look at it as kind of a dividend. Your focus is really on uh, the Remain Co. anyway. And so that's kind of like a classic example of, of why some of these spinoffs are just sold indiscriminately. And if you do your work ahead of time, um, you can pick up some, some pretty interesting opportunities. Yeah, excellent. And your results in the space, of course, we know have been uh, tremendous returns. Um, for students to continue learning about uh, special situations and spinoffs in particular, I know you've mentioned some resources in the past, uh, Joel Greenblatt's books, uh, his notes from his Columbia classes, and special situations in stocks and bonds, the book by Maurice Schiller. Are there any additional resources that you would recommend students? Yeah, so I would recommend... Um... Let's see. So I'd recommend, I, I love Peter Lynch's book. I think One Up on Wall Street is very good. He talks about spinoffs a little bit, how he likes to invest in spinoffs, especially if there's insider buying, which tends to be a very strong signal, um, especially for, for recent spinoffs. So that's a good book that I would definitely recommend. Um, Joel Greenblatt also taught a class at Columbia in the notes from his lecture. Actually, the entire lecture is available, um, the entire class. So that's a really nice resource that you can that you can access as well. And then, um, you know, I know you're probably on on, on FinTwit, but um, I would definitely recommend getting on Twitter. 
um, not only for spinoffs and special situations, but just like any investments, especially if you're somebody who is not a professional, so you don't necessarily have access to sell side research or other resources that maybe other hedge funds do. Um, it's a great resource. Uh, basically, all the best managers are on Fintwit, whether they're anonymous or not. And it's really great because it's an anonymous field where you can even share your analysis. And if you have good analysis and you have a good idea, uh, more people are going to follow you and you can even, you know, get people to start pay paying attention to the stock, um, to the stock that you really like. Um, the other thing that I would recommend is just, um, you know, start start investing. I think there's no better way uh, to learn than to actually start investing and make mistakes in your thesis doesn't have to be super complicated. Um, you know, read those that Joel Greenblatt book, uh, the Peter Lynch books. It doesn't have to be rocket science. You, you know, you just have to have a thesis that you believe in. Um, and usually it's the simpler, the better. Um, but what will happen is you'll either be proven wrong or right for the right or wrong reasons. But the fact that you uh, hopefully kept it, keep a journal, and that's, that's what I definitely recommend uh, folks do, it'll allow you to really learn from your mistakes and learn from your successes too. So um, yeah, I'd say just kind of start investing, soak up all the information you can, and then definitely uh, keep a journal or start a Substack or, or join Twitter and, um, and kind of engage in the community. Yeah, that sounds excellent. And uh, students had uh, some questions about a few of your thesis. One of them was uh, for Thangela Resources, how did you find it originally? And what are your views on the companies today? Yeah, so Thungella Resources, um, it's, it's a really interesting company. And in Joel Greenblatt's book, he says to look at the companies that are perceived to be toxic waste. And this was like a perfect example of a company that looked like it was toxic waste. Basically, Anglo-American is a big uh, multinational uh, materials company, um, a commodity company, essentially. They had exposure to, to thermal coal in South Africa, which was a very small asset for them. And as you all probably know, it's not very ESG friendly. You know, coal is, is uh, the, the worst of the, um, of, the, of, the, of the carbons in terms of um, emitting, you know, greenhouse, greenhouse gases. And so um, they basically just wanted to get these assets off, off their books. And so um, it, it looked from that perspective, it looked like toxic waste. I will say that like, don't just invest in something because it looks like toxic waste, because a lot of times it will be toxic waste. But in this case, the, the really interesting thing, um, or I guess, first of all, how did I find out about it? So I monitor um, basically Google, um, you guys probably know, but you guys can use Google alerts to monitor a bunch of keywords. Some of the keywords that I monitor are stock spinoff, spinoff, um, international spinoff, demerger, uh, special situation, um, uh, special dividend, and um, and I can definitely you know share with you afterwards kind of a list of of the Google keywords that I monitored. But I was able to you know stumble upon this uh, through some Google Google alerts, which is completely free to everybody. And I actually missed it right out of the bat, um, but I I looked at it um, shortly after it started trading, and the 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 reason why it looked really interesting was because uh, coal prices had really started to strengthen and the stock had been very well capitalized by Anglo-American. So it had, it had been basically gifted um, with 2.5 billion South African Rand. And so it had a strong balance sheet, no debt. Um, and then Anglo-American had also promised that if they had, if, um, if the coal market had turned in 2022, which of course it, it didn't, Anglo American would support uh, Thunkella with additional resources. So it looked like the downside was pretty protected. The company was not going to go bankrupt. Um, but the cool thing was that coal prices were just you know going through the roof, and the company was um, generating a lot of free cash flow, and management had kind of guided in their analyst presentation. They gave you, I'm not a, you know, I'm not an expert in really any sector. Um, so like, I'm definitely not an expert in commodities or, or coal, but you could basically plug in the assumptions that ma the management gave you and build your own basic model to forecast how much earnings and how much cash flow and how much EBITDA the business was going to generate. And this, the, um, you know, just running some basic assumptions, you could see that the company was going to generate 
a lot of free cash flow. And so, it, you know, when I initially recommended it, I think it was trading at like 2% or two times free cash flow. And this is the business that had no debt, no debt on it whatsoever. Um, the other thing that I really look for, especially if it's a, you know, potential value trap, right? Like, you know, should call assets trade at two times cash flow? It sounds a little cheap, but but maybe. Um, but the, the nice thing that I really liked about this setup was that the prompt, the company had uh, predetermined that they were going to, they had a dividend policy in place where they were going to uh, pay out 30% of their free cash flow to shareholders. And so 30% of, you know, the free cash flow that they was going to generate was a, re- was a really big number. And I actually thought I was wrong, but I thought they were going to declare the dividend when they reported initial, uh, initial mid-year results. And, you know, that, that ended up not happening, but essentially we, we were going to have to wait until right about now, I think in March, they're probably going to initiate their inaugural dividend. The thing is, so I, I recommended it. I think we got in around kind of mid 45 for the South African listed stock. We got out, I got out around 70. So it was a really nice return. I, um, the problem with commodity companies is, is, they're, they have no control over the ultimate commodity. And so coal started crashing. I kind of, uh, the, the, from a technical perspective, the stock uh, broke through its, its 50-day moving average. Um, th- there was not a lot of transparency. And so, so I kind of um, got spooked out of the stock a little bit, still made, you know, I think 90%, so a very good return. The stock continued to fall, ended up bottoming, and has started to come back and is, is looking actually really attractive right now. They recently announced a, or I guess in early December, they announced an update. And the update was basically, hey, listen, we have 8 billion Rand of cash on our balance sheet. The market cap is only about 12 billion Rand. And they, they did say that they're going to um, keep a cash buffer of about 6 billion Rand, which I think is prudent, you know, if at some point the market's going to turn. But essentially, by my estimate, you know, they can pay out um, 1.5 to 2 billion Rand. Um, so it works out to like a 15%, um, a 15% or so dividend, which I think should be declared in, I think in March, whenever they announce their final year end results. What do I think about the stock? I'm actually tempted to get back, to get back into it. Um, it is a trade though, for me, it's just, a. I just don't have long-term conviction in the story, even though it's so, it's so cheap and they're gushing free cash flow. Um, the thing, the other thing that I, um, I mean, right now it's still only trading, it's trading at, you know, one and a half times free cash flow because coal prices have come back up again. Um, and if you look at it on an enterprise value, kind of backing up the net cash, it looks ridiculously cheap. So um, the other thing that is important to monitor with spinoffs, and I got this from Joel Greenblatt from his book, is pay attention to incentives. And so the one thing that's really interesting about management is they got issued a bunch of stock that's going to vest, 50% is going to vest in June, and then 50% is going to vest in uh, June of 2023. Um, but it's a decent amount of stock. Like I think it's about $8 million of stock or so. It's it's a sizable chunk. And so my re- reading of that is that they have an incentive to get the stock price up. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did um, declare a pretty big dividend. Um, not only not a, not a dividend, a decent dividend, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they declared a bit, pretty big share buyback um, because that would, if they pay a dividend after the dividend um, is paid out, the stock's going to drop. So that doesn't really benefit them that much, even though they promised that they're going to have to pay out some sort of dividend. But I think I wouldn't be surprised if they really leaned into uh, stock buybacks because I think that's how they're going to get, uh, you know, looking out for themselves, that's how they're going to get. Um, you know, the most money out of, out of, out of their brand. So yeah, I, I don't own the stock. I like it. I'm tempted to trade back in. I just caution that it's, you know, it's a trade. So you might, you know, want to own it. I think it's probably good to own into the dividend announcement. Um, and then you could also, you know, just be nimble just because it is, you know, these companies are so hard to predict because again, they can't, you, you, you don't know, nobody really knows what the ultimate price of the commodity is going to be, you know, in six months. Yeah, absolutely. That's very interesting, though, for sure. And can you please discuss uh, how you found out about uh, the ECN capital opportunity and your thesis on that as well? Oh, yeah. So um, so <laughs> it's so funny. So um, e- so I, this is all Google Alert. So it's all it's all free stuff. Um, but essentially, one of the one of the keywords that I monitor is is um, is special dividend. 
And so this is, this is a really, this is kind of a thing that I've noticed in the market that um, essentially a company, what happened with ECN, I noticed that they were going to sell a, um, a big part of their business and uh, it was going to result. So the, the deal was announced last year in the summer and they announced that they were going to um, eventually when it closes, pay out $7.50 as a dividend. Um, and at the, at the time, I think the stock was $10 or so. Um, and so the stock jumped up to about $10.50. This was trading on the Canadian exchange. And so I, I put that in the, in the back of my mind. I, um, you know, put it on my watch list, continued to do work, um, tried to kind of understand the business um, with the thought process that it might be an interesting stock to own at some point. You know, the transaction was going to close in December. So we had a long, I think the, the initial deal was announced in, in July or August, and it wasn't going to close in until December. So I kind of uh, put it on my watch list, but really didn't do anything about it. Um, interestingly, I had access through Schwab. So Schwab is my broker, and you get free access to Credit Suisse uh, sell side research. And so um, luckily, you know, Credit Suisse covered the company, and they estimated that that Remain Co. Uh, was worth about five dollars. I think either five dollars or five dollars and fifty cents. And so, a lot of people kind of poo-poo Southside Research, but from my perspective, I really value it because, again, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in uh, South African coal companies. I'm not an expert in Canadian specialty, you know, uh, finance companies. But if like an industry expert um, can say, "Hey, I think the Remain Co is worth, you know, five dollars and fifty cents." That gives me something to kind of to kind of hang my hat on, and so and then I did my own work. I read up. There was a good write up on Value Investors Club, and it seemed like the management team was actually uh, pretty impressive. And um, and so you know we continue to creep closer to the date. They kept announcing that they think the deal is gonna it's on track to close. We think it's gonna close in in December. And um, at the time, um, the stock was trading. I think around $10.50, give or take. It was kind of, the volatility was, was very low because everybody was waiting for this transaction to, to finally close and for the dividend to be paid out. Um, but essentially, you know, I knew that the Remain Co, um, I kind of looked at the Credit Suisse assumptions and it looked like a pretty good um, bet that the Remain Co is worth $5.50 at least. And so you add it all up and you get about a $13, um, you know, total value and the stock's trading at $10.50, like a nice, decent kind of 20, you know, 23% return um, over a very short time period if you can if you can buy it kind of close to the transaction date. So um, so essentially, it's kind of like a merger arbitrage situation in, in a way, but kind of like a reverse merger arbitrage um, where you, you buy it right before this transaction is announced. People love a special dividend. So after the special dividend is announced, even though it was telegraphed, you know, people didn't react until it was announced and the stock started to drift up close to 11 and 12. And then, um, and then eventually the dividend was paid out and the stock dropped, um, you know, close to $5, but it's trading, it's trading kind of right around uh, $5, I think in 30 cents. So pretty close to where I thought it was, it was valued. Um, the other, what I think is really interesting about these types of transactions is that there's a little bit of a tax arbitrage. So, um, the cool thing, and I love these transactions, but um, essentially, you um, uh, um, it's essentially the dividend that's paid out. As long as you own the stock, and I am not a tax advisor, I'm not an expert, but my understanding and my um, my understanding of this situation was the dividends paid out. So seven dollars and fifty cents is paid out. Uh, I got that seven dollar and fifty cent dividend, and it's taxed at a dividend. Uh, tax rate, which in the U.S. is favorable, it's you know between fifteen and twenty percent. Um, in the in the actual example, a part of the return was considered return of capital, so not all of it was a dividend, but let's just assume it was all a dividend. So you get taxed on a dollar, you get taxed at fifteen percent to twenty percent on that special dividend, um, and y- as long as you you have to, the caveat is you have to hold the stock for for sixty one days. But then the cool thing is the stock drops. If the market's efficient, it's going to drop by $7.50. You bought it at, you know, we bought it at $10.50 or $11. It's going to drop um, in an efficient market by $7.50. And you get to realize a short-term capital loss of $7.50. 
and which the the short term cap loss is 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 much higher than the dividend tax rate. So there's a little bit of a tax arbitrage in there, which which I really like. Um, and uh, and so that's what that's what made so like usually if you have a situation like this where it's a 22 percent return in a very short period that's great but you're gonna have to pay short-term capital gains but in this case you know we were able to get a like a pretty good you know close to 22 23 percent return um with very minimal um tax um with a, a very minimal tax drag so that was that was really cool but to answer the question the, the way i found out about it was just a google alert um special um special dividend yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that uh, thought process. And you spoke about uh, Garrett's motion in an interview in mid-2019. Have you taken a look at the stock uh, post-bankruptcy? Yeah, I have. So I um, I, I own it. I'm, I'm actually recommending it. Um, there's a really good um, podcast episode by yet another uh, value podcast, which you might have listened to, which really spells out the thesis. Um, but I, you know, when the, when the spinoff happened, I, you know, I, I do love these situations where there's going to be indiscriminate selling pressure, but the setup looked horrible because this was 2019. It's a cyclical industry, the auto industry, auto suppliers. They had a ton of debt on the business. Uh, Honeywell had spun out Garrett Motion. Um, we were at the end of the economic cycle. You didn't know when it was going to end, but it was going to end at some point. Um, a lot of debt. And then they had saddle gear motion with a bunch of um, asbestos liabilities. So it, it really did look like toxic waste. And, and so, you know, the grow, if you just follow that rule blindly, you would have, you would have bought it. You would have, um, you know, lost, lost money, even though it looked like it was trading really, really cheaply. I got interested because there's a lot of good um, research done, but essentially I came to appreciate that the business model was actually pretty good. Um, a very low capital intensity business. It was an oligopoly market. Um, they had pretty good pricing power. And so it was cyclical because it depends on the end shipment of cars. But in terms of you know their margins, their EBITDA margins, they were much better than a lot of the other auto suppliers and a lot less um, capital intensive. So it looked really interesting. I never was able to pull the trigger. And the biggest thing that, that, that um, kept me from pulling the trigger was um, insiders weren't buying. So it looked crazy cheap. And I was like, why aren't insiders buying if this is as cheap as it looks? And it turns out they weren't buying because they were negotiating with Honeywell. Honeywell had saddled gear motion with an asbestos liability. Um, and as you can imagine, when a parent company is spinning off a subsidiary, that's not an arm's length transaction. Basically, the CEO of Garrett before the spinoff reports to the CEO of Honeywell. So it's like, yeah, whatever, boss, give us as much asbestos liability as, as, as you want. I'm good as long as I'm going to be the CEO of a, of a new company. And so it clearly wasn't an arm's length transaction. Garrett thought it was unfair. Um, they tried to negotiate with Honeywell to limit the liability. Um, Honeywell uh, just basically delayed and the delaying track tactic was effective because every year that they delayed, they got another 175 million uh, payment from Garrett Motion. And so effectively Garrett Motion eventually just declared bankruptcy and during the, uh, declaring bankruptcy was just a ploy. I mean, it was a tactic to essentially um, get, um, basically get uh, Honeywell to actually agree to go to court and have a judge decide what is the right what is the right liability um, for this for this asbestos liability that that Garrett was saddled with and so um, essentially you know I'm not by any means a bankruptcy a post bankruptcy um, you know reorg expert but essentially there were lots of lots of iterations um, whereby eventually the liability it had previously kind of been uncapped um, but essentially, um, Garrett paid Honeywell by, I think, $300 million. And then they had another uh, preferred security that they owe um, Honeywell um, that they're, that they're going to end up um, prepaying pretty much er pretty early. And the stock ended up emerging from bankruptcy. And um, basically, it's a, it's a little weird to look at right now because if you just pull up the market cap on, on Yahoo Finance, for instance, the market cap looks incredibly low. But the way to look at it is um, there's a bunch of preferred shares, which is that's the way that I own the stock. And essentially the preferred shares uh, get a basically a 5.5 or a, I think it's um, I think it's maybe an 8% dividend yield um, based on, I think, a $5.5 uh, conversion price. 
And so basically, if you own the preferred shares, you get to accrue that dividend over time. And then you also get the right to exchange your shares and convert into common shares over time. And I think there's a forced mechanism, which will uh, force all uh, preferred shareholders to eventually uh, change into common. So looking on kind of on a fully diluted basis, the stock is, um, you know, looks really attractive. It's trading. Um, you know, at six or seven times, you know, free cash flow and free cash flow is pretty depressed just because the auto um, sector has been hit hard by the chip shortage. And so I like, I like Garrett Motion a lot. I, when I recommended it, I thought that the stock would perform really well over the next 12 months and it's kind of treaded water. Uh, it's down a little bit. And that's really just a result, I think, of the chip shortage and uh, the, 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 um, uh, basically, not many cars uh, being able to be manufactured um, because they can't get enough chips. And so that is something that's going to get resolved eventually. So it's kind of like you're buying the company right now at a very reasonable valuation on, um, on not I won't say trough earnings, but like definitely not peak earnings. And once the auto cycle swings into full gear, um, they're going to generate a lot more revenue, a lot more earnings, and a lot more EBITDA. And then the other um, big thing is that you have Oak Tree and a, a bunch of other smart hedge funds who own a bunch of the shares, uh, but they don't have control. And so, um, you know, you're kind of, we're investing alongside Oak Tree. You know, most investors have to pay two and 20 to do that. Um, in this case, we get to kind of ride their coattails and their capital allocation for free. And, um, and then I didn't even talk about what they do. So it's a turbocharger business. So turbochargers basically make internal combustion engines more fuel efficient. So if you want to comply with uh, emission standards, um, but you don't want to sacrifice engine power, a turbocharger is a great way to, uh, to get that outcome. Um, the the, the long-term bear case is that uh, basically the whole world is going electric, you know, as I think I, I would agree. Um, but uh, basically the, the thesis is that that's going to take, you know, it's going to take at least till 2030, 2035, and in the meantime, the company's going to be generating a ton of free cash flow and, you know, using it to, um, you know, pay down debt and then maybe, you know, pay out special dividends to investors. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the thesis in a nutshell. But, yeah, I still like that one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's very interesting. And uh, you've had a lot of big winners in the past. Your biggest winner has been uh, Liberated Syndication, from my understanding. But uh, what are some other big winners that you've had in the past? I think, yeah, it's so funny because... Um, you have so my biggest winners have been the micro cap ones. So, yeah. um, in it, the, the micro cap spinoffs are most interesting to me because you know, I don't have a ton of money, so I, I can invest in them. And they, you know, if, you, if you're managing a billion dollars, um, it's just kind of irrelevant. These micro cap spinoffs are irre irrelevant, but you can find you know, ridiculous opportunities. There's a lot of micro cap crap. Um, in the, in the spinoff world, um, like I forget the name of the company, but there's a company that's doing a spinoff. They're spinning off their, you know, Bitcoin mining operation and they're, they're, you know, pivoting into like NFTs. And whenever you see a company that's, that's in a bunch of different quote unquote hot sectors, usually, you know, it's, if not a fraud, it's, it's something to definitely steer clear of. And so there's a lot of crap like that, but occasionally you'll find a gem. So Liberated Syndication was a podcast hosting company. Um, I won't get into all the details, but, it, you know, secular growth growing 20% plus and it was trading at only, uh, basically like two times earnings. So ridiculously cheap, you know, um, really tiny, tiny company. So like, you know, you're not going to find that very often. Um, BBX capital is another name that is, is the exact same, you know, setup. So basically, um, it was a spinoff, um, from, what was it a spinoff of? from like BB uh, something vacation. It was like a vacation timeshare company. And um, basically it was a holding company, had a bunch of assets. And what they did was they spun out some of those assets into a company called BBX Capital. And BBX Capital owned, a, it had a bunch of cash, a note receivable, a profitable uh, uh, real estate business, and a couple other um, subsidiaries. And it began trading and it was trading at, at, at basically 50 cents on the dollar. So it had, it had, a, it had cash, say cash, net cash of a hundred million dollars in its market cap. I'm making these numbers up, but essentially it was trading at 50 cents on the dollar, even though it had 
Um, usually, like uh, you'll see biotechs that are trading at a negative enterprise value, but they're burning cash every year. In this case, this was a company that was generating positive free cash flow, um, but it was trading basically at you know half the value of its cash on its balance sheet. So it was a, it was a no brainer. Like when you when you see situations like that, um, just kind of the pattern recognition kicks in. Um, and that one's, you know, that one's, that one's definitely uh, one of our, one of our uh, bigger winners. There was some hair in that one. Like uh, there, there are corporate governance concerns. So a lot of people are concerned, um, the family that controls the company, you know, what, what, what are they going to do uh, with the company? There's a reason why it's trading um, so cheaply. But when you find a company that's trading um, at a negative enterprise value, um, and it's not burning cash, and it actually has a profitable business, even if you give them a big, a big haircut for corporate governance concerns, usually you're going to do quite well investing in those in those securities. So um, so yeah, that's that's another one that, uh, that comes to mind. I'd also have plenty of losers too, so we can talk about uh, the losers as well. Exactly. That was actually the next question. Um, we know you've mentioned the quorum health in the past, but what are some other ones that you'd like to discuss? Yeah, so um, the biggest one, and it's so funny because I published a, a thread on it recently, um, KLXC, KLX Energy Services, and it's actually starting to perform really well. So it's it's starting to tick up. But essentially the thesis was that, and I think the thesis was actually pretty valid. I just didn't cut my loss soon enough. Um, essentially, um, KLX Inc. was a company that was a aero parts distributor, and it was run by a guy named Amin Corey who was kind of a famous guy, famous executive who had um, basically built up BE Aerospace and, uh, and sold it sold it over time. And then he announced that he was basically selling um, um, uh, KLX Inc., the air, air, uh, the air, air, plate, um, air parts distributor business for a nice premium. And he had thought about selling this uh, KLX energy services business, but he didn't want to because um, the prices that, he was he was receiving the market he didn't think were fair and so he said i'm going to keep it and so my thesis was like hey this is a proven executive he sold two businesses for like you know 13 14 times EBITDA. this guy knows what he's doing um he also uh he he chose to forego salary in 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 lieu of receiving stock of the in the company so it's like this is great you know our incentives are aligned um, this guy knows what he's doing. He's super smart. He's 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 going to manage this business, and um, and they didn't have any debt, which was amazing as well. Um, what the first red flag, and honestly, this should have I should have just closed my recommendation. Um, they basically uh, announced a really accretive, really interesting acquisition, but then to pay for that acquisition, they had to issue debt that was like twelve or eleven and a half percent debt, just almost egregiously expensive debt. And I, you know, one of the things that was so attractive to me about this was you had this great executive and you had basically no debt. And then they go and issue this incredibly expensive debt. And it was basically a message to me that basically the credit, the creditors, which are usually more concerned about the downside, um, really don't respect or have much confidence in the business prospects or the sustainability of KLX's business. And so that should have been a red flag that allowed me to, you know, to, to, to sell out, but I ended up hanging in there. Um, another thing that kind of tricked me was insiders kept buying all the way down. Um, and, um, and, you know, I was thinking these guys are smart. They know what they're doing. Um, I'm going to dollar cost average down. Um, that turned out to be a mistake. I've, I've learned, you know, to, to really think twice before averaging down, you know, I'm more inclined now to, to average up when I have a good idea that's working and the market's recognizing. And so, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a good idea. I mean, one of the reasons why I think the idea was not a great idea to begin with was the risk reward wasn't super attractive. Um, I think my upside case was only about 40% upside and with a, with a commodity company like a Thungello or a KLX, you need to have some really good upside in order to justify um, the risk because their cost of capital is so high. Their cost of debt was almost 12%. So um, I think that was the first red flag. And then the next red flag was that cost of debt. Um, I probably should have cut my losses on that one. Yeah, thank you for sharing that example with us. It's very helpful. And uh, you seem to focus more on spinoffs than other types of special situations. Uh, why would you say that is? 
Um, I'd say, um, I guess it's just my niche, you know, that's kind of like what I, what I started on. It's what my newsletter is about. And so that's my primary focus. Um, but I think I, I honestly, um, I'm just looking for good ideas. So, um, if you guys have any good ideas or, or uh, I have a bias towards small and micro cap ideas, just because it's the sandbox that I can play in that not a, you know, that other really successful investors can't because they're managing too much money. And so I tend to find my most compelling ideas, I think in the micro cap and small cap space, doesn't, that doesn't always um, be the case. Bausch and Loam, um, Bausch Pharma is, is, uh, looks, I think, pretty interesting to me right now. And it's in the midst of a, of a spinoff transaction. That's a, you know, an $8 billion market cap company. Um, so it doesn't have to be a small and micro cap company, but those tend to be um, my, my biggest winners. Um, but I think like special situations are just really, really interesting. Um, I'll give you guys a couple more examples. So the dividend, the special dividend is something that I've just noticed in the market where the market, even if a special dividend has been previewed, um, the market for some reason doesn't fully reflect that special dividend until it's actually announced. And so you can also play that with options. Um, I did that with VMware because we knew that VMware was going to pay a big special dividend. Uh, and so you can buy the options. And when the when the dividend was announced, you know, the options options popped. So that that's a nice, um, interesting, you know, special situation. Um, what other ones are 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 so one um kind of I think these are really super cool. These have to do with spinoffs, but oftentimes a uh, company will um, IPO a, like 20% of a division and then spin off the remaining 80%. But the way that they do it is, is through what's called the split off transaction. And so I'll, I'll take an example. Um, Eli Lilly uh, did this with Elanco, which was their animal health business. They IPO 20% of the business and then they decided that they were going to spin off the remaining 80% of Elanco. But instead of just distributing it to the Eli Lilly shareholders, what they did was they said, okay, you're an Eli Lilly shareholder. You can either um, choose to uh, give up some Eli Lilly shares and receive Elanco um, animal shares, or you can just keep your Eli Lilly shares, whatever you want to do. But because because Elanco was a small cap and Eli Lilly was a large cap, um, what they do when you have these split off transactions is they incentivize uh, the shareholders to basically um, choose to, to receive shares in the spinoff as opposed to keep their Eli Lilly shares. And they do that by basically giving you between seven and 9% more value in the spinoff than you would have had in the parent company. So say you own a thousand dollars worth of Eli Lilly. In this case, they said, okay, we're going to give you a thousand dollars seventy, you know, one thousand seventy dollars of Elanco Animal Health to basically encourage you to um, to go ahead and, and take the shares of the spinoff. Um, and obviously, that's like a free seven percent, so everybody's going to want to want to take advantage of that. But there are odd lot provisions, and an odd lot provision is basically if you own under hundred shares you get, you're guaranteed to get basically fully allocated. So if you want to change, exchange all of your 99 Eli, Eli Lilly shares for um, basically 7% more value in Elanco shares, you're, you're guaranteed to do that if you have an odd lot. And so with Eli Lilly, there are a lot of these types of transactions. You're basically able to make kind of like a free or a very low risk between 700 and like $2,000 in a couple of weeks. So I love those transactions. Like for like a big investor, it doesn't doesn't move the needle, but um, it's kind of fun to basically kind of create like a free seven hundred or a thousand dollars, basically out of, out of out of nothing. So that's that's one special situation that I that I, I think are really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And you also mentioned in the past uh, that the four hour work week, the book really influenced your life and it helped to inspire you to start your blog. What are some other books that you like that are not in the investing space? Oh yeah, let's see. Um, great question. So I love reading biographies. Um, I don't know why, but I I love um, reading just about how other people have kind of built their businesses. So um, Arnold Arnold Ar, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger has an awesome um, biography. You know, he grew up in um, in Austria and basically um, basically completely uh, created himself. Um, immigrated to the United States, um, became a bodybuilding champion, became a movie star, became the highest, you know, grossing movie star in the world. Really cool story to, to kind of hear that. 
Um, Jim Cook, who's the founder of Boston Beer Works, or, or um, Boston Beer, he wrote he wrote a book that was really interesting. Um, I think it's called Quench, Quench Your Thirst. And um, it, it also really helped me to quit my job at the time. I had a stable, you know, high paying job and I, I wanted to, to risk it to, to, you know, start this, this business, business idea. Um, and he basically said, he, um, he, at the time, you know, he went to Harvard, Har- I think Harvard undergrad, maybe Harvard law and Harvard MBA, like, you know, obviously a, a very, very smart guy. He was doing the typical route working at Boston um, consulting group, BCG, you know, great job making really good money traveling around talking to you know advising you know smart ceos um living a really good life but he wanted to uh basically start a brewery he had an itching and a calling to do something you know to do something entrepreneurial and um one thing that really resonated with me is he thought about risk and and people said isn't it really risky to leave the boston consulting you have this you have a guaranteed you know amazing lifestyle and he said, he said something like, you know, isn't the biggest risk of all that you'll live a life that you regret? Or it's, I'm butchering the quote, but it's, it's something along the lines of like um, living a life that you're unsatisfied with or, or not having the conviction, the courage to kind of follow your convictions. And so that, that kind of really resonated with me. It's kind of reframing risk. You know, what's the worst that could happen if my, if my venture doesn't work out, I can probably get another job, you know, at some point. Um, but yeah, I, I love books. I'm not a big, um, fiction reader. Like I, unfortunately, I, it doesn't have to be like a business book, but I, I love reading biographies. I'm reading, um, uh, biography of Caesar, uh, recently. I'm, I just finished Al- Alexander the Great. I don't know why I love biographies, but I just find them really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. They are very, very interesting. And can you discuss your uh, thesis for Champion Next, please? Yes. Yeah. So Champion X was, um, this was another, so this was another split off transaction. Very interesting. Where Ecolab was essentially spinning off its upstream oil and gas chemicals business. So, you know, people are starting to warm up to energy right now, but this was uh, in, I think, June of 2020. So oil had been negative $40, I think, in in April of, of 2020. So it's a very kind of precarious time in the market, but essentially, um, Champion X was split. It was um, going to be so. Champion X was the spinoff of Ecolab, um, but it was going to be merging with another um, upstream or uh, another energy services company called Apergy. And so, essentially, what Ecolab did was they said, "Hey, Ecolab shareholders, you can either." Um, you can keep your Ecolab shares or you can share to, you can choose to exchange your Ecolab shares for shares of this new company called Champion X. And to incentivize you because it's energy and, you know, everybody hates energy right now. We're going to um, uh, give you 11% more uh, value in Champion X shares than you have in Ecolab shares. So it's a really attractive setup. You know, I ended up participating in that and I recommended folks participate in that. I think we made, you know, a thousand bucks or, or, or give or take. Um, but I didn't recommend hanging on to the, the Champion X shares. I, I uh, just recommended selling and really booking my profit. But the more I uh, looked into um, Champion X, um, what they did, they did a really good job um, essentially laying out what the EBITDA and what the free cash flow of the business looked like in the past two bear markets. So 20, 2016 and also I think um, 2009, um, the last couple of bear markets for energy. And so um, the business, even at that time, was generating tremendous amounts of free cash flow. And I think the stock was trading at like something like six times trough free cash flow, you know. And so that looked incredibly compelling. And then the other aspect about Champion X that I didn't fully appreciate is um, their business, even though it's upstream and nobody wants oil and gas, um, it was very dependent on uh, production of oil and gas wells. So in other words, um, oil and gas companies didn't have to spend uh, CapEx to use Champion X and Apergee. They had to spend just OpEx to make sure that they were measuring the pressure of their wells. They were adding the right amount of chemicals if a certain certain balance was off. And so it wasn't nearly as cyclical as some of the other energy services companies like KLXE. And so once I had a better appreciation for that and I understood that 
the thing was basically trading at, you know, if you can buy a cyclical business trading at a trough multiple on trough earnings, that's usually a really good setup. And so the stock, um, you know, I think we got in around 14. Um, the stock ended up, we sold out around 22 or so. And, you know, right now, um, the company, it's a good business. Um, they're generating good free cash flow. You know, I think the stock could be a $30 stock over time, but they're basically diversifying their business. They're making acquisitions to really kind of get out of the oil and gas space. And I mean, I just don't know who really wants to own, own that right now. You know, it's probably the right idea uh, for an oil and gas company, seeing as, you know, oil and gas is going to be, you know, in secular terminal decline for a long time. But at the same time, it's kind of like you either are an oil and gas company or you're not. And I don't necessarily want to wait around and, and um, wait for that, wait for that transition. Um, you know, they usually say, so one thing that I've grown to appreciate is, is to cut your losers, AKA um, KLXE, but also let your winners run. And so with that one, I was kind of thinking, you know, should I let this one, it's not overly expensive, but you know, the best case scenario that I could see for the stock was that it was kind of a mid thirties or maybe low forties stock. It wasn't going to be just a monster, uh, monster situation where um, another company that I've, you know, like and have recommended is actually pull back recently is IDT. So that one was up a lot, looked, looked kind of a little bit expensive, but it's a company that I could look out a couple of years. I could see it doubling again. And so that one, I was, I'm more comfortable with hanging, just be hanging on to just because I did like the secular kind of long-term outlook um, for that one. But yeah, a champion X was a, was a great trade, but um, just decided, you know, to move on just because, um, you know, ultimately there are better opportunities elsewhere. You just mentioned IDT, right? Yeah. What's your thesis for that? Yeah. Nowadays. So IDT, um, if you guys are familiar, um, there are certain companies that are like spinoff machines. So IAC is a spinoff machine. They most recently spun off Vimeo, but prior to that, they spun off Match. They spun off, I think, Expedia before it ultimately maybe was acquired. They spun off, um, let's see, Ticketmaster. I think they've spun off, you know, the, the guy that runs a beer dealer is you know, one of those outsider type CEOs, um, very well regarded capital allocator. So IAC is a, is a great company and um, you'll do very well owning IAC. Um, IDT is like a mini version of IAC. So basically they've spun off, I think five or six companies over the past um, 10 years. And not all of them have worked really well, but it's been pretty incredible. Um, if you just kind of run the total return on, on the spinoffs, um, you know, you look at IDT stock and it doesn't look that interesting, but that's because it's not including all these five incredibly profitable spinoffs that either have been acquired or are trading at, at really high valuations. And so the really interesting thing about, about IDT is it has a core business, basically a core um, uh, telecommunications business. Essentially, their business is they sell, um, I'm, you know, simplifying it, but they sell, uh, you know, calling card and calling plans. Um, to people who have immigrated from other parts of the world um, that enable them to, you know, call, call back home. Um, they also have money, uh, kind of money remittance services that allow um, immigrants to basically transfer money back to their home and other countries and a bunch of different kind of businesses that basically cater to this, this, this population. But the cool thing about the company is that they've, it's a, it's a, that's a declining business. Well, what they've done is they've taken the cash flows that this business has generated and redeployed um, those cash flows to start other businesses. Um, the, the most interesting business of those is a company called um, NRS, and it's basically a, a terminal, kind of like a payment terminal business, but their niche that they're focused on is convenience stores and bodegas. So it's kind of like a, a little niche, you know, you don't think of as necessarily the most um, tech forward, but getting a terminal that they can, that these bodega owners can use to um, manage inventory, uh, do sales, um, bring the cash register, um, provide much, much uh, better analytics into, you know, who their customers are, um, get some advertising revenue. And this is a recurring, uh, a recurring revenue model um, so it makes it makes it very interesting. And then they also just have tremendous growth. So I think they can grow 10x from where they are right now. 
And if you look at other kind of payment um, point of sale businesses like Toast, Toast is a, you know, is kind of a good competitor. They don't compete with NRS, but even with the, the big pullback, still trading at, at a very, very high revenue multiple. So the thesis is that ultimately um, that asset is going to get spun out. And, you know, I have confidence in that because they've done it five or six times in the past, right? And then in addition, they have another asset um, called net to phone which is based like a cloud-based uh, communications uh, service. So if you're a small and medium-sized enterprise and you don't want to have um, kind of a, a legacy on-premise phone system in your office, you want to be able to, um, you know, work from home and access your voicemail on the cloud and link it up with Microsoft Teams and be able to basically have all your communication needs uh, seamlessly integrated, you'd be a candidate for, for net to phone. And so again, there's a lot of other um, you know, SaaS-based uh, companies that focus on this niche, usually a little bit higher market that trade at very high multiples, even, even though you know, we've seen some compression in some of these high growth, high growth names. So the thesis is essentially that eventually these assets are going to be spun out. The first one's probably gonna be net to phone. Um, and then the second one's going to be NRS. That's probably going to be spun off um, probably at some point in 2023. And we, I have confidence that it's going to happen because they have the track record of doing it, doing it in the past. And so it's a sum of the parts investment case. And um, but but uh, you know problems with the sum of the parts investment case is, is a lot of times you don't know when the catalyst is going to take place. And I have a lot of cattle. I have a lot of confidence that ultimately this is going to take place. I don't know when it is going to take place, but I think. Um, I'm very confident that it that it ultimately will. So that's that's the um, that's the thesis in a nutshell. Um, there's a um, so Alta Fox Capital is a fund manager that many of you um, maybe follow, but if you don't, you definitely should follow Connor Haley on on Twitter, and he runs Alta Fox Capital. He publishes research uh, for free. Um, you know, he he's he's biased because he he buys a stock and then publishes research. But he did tremendous, he and his team did tremendous work on um, IDT and kind of laying out the value that they see there. And so, um, you know, definitely check that out. It's available on their website to learn more about IDT. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that thinking. Our second to last question is, uh, can you please uh, detail some of your thesis for NextPoint's uh, Strategic Opportunities Fund? Yes. Yeah. So I did, um, I know we we're talking before we went live on um, on the, uh, I had, this is my second podcast of the day. So I, I spoke to Andrew Walker from yet another value podcast. And so I pitched, um, uh, next point diversified REIT on that podcast as well. So you can get, um, you know, a full, um, listen to that. I think it should be published by the end of the week, but in a nutshell, um, next point is right now a closed end fund. There aren't many natural buyers of closed end funds, you know, no professional investor will buy a closed end fund. You know, maybe a few retail investors will will buy closed in funds, but there's no about half the market is owned by passive investors right now, or, or half of the stock market is owned by passive investors, but no passive investor is going to be owning a closed end fund. And so, what um, this closed end fund is doing is they're basically transitioning to a REIT, and so they have a bunch of kind of random assets. The majority of them are real estate based, but they also have some. Um, you know, some equity, some debt securities that they're in the process of liquidating and redeploying into, into um, real estate assets. Uh, but essentially the thesis is that the, the stock is trading at about a 40% discount to its net asset value. And it pays a four and a half percent dividend yield. And so the downside is probably pretty limited. And they're in the process of transitioning to become a REIT. Once they are a REIT, they'll be eligible for index inclusion and a lot of passive investors will most likely come in and, and start buying the stock. Um, that's kind of, you know, so you could get like a 50 or 60% pop, you know, from that, but longer term, uh, the bigger opportunity is basically the management team selling the, this hodgepodge of assets, redeploying it into interesting real estate opportunities generating excess free cash flow and then doing the same thing again, basically buying more real estate assets, um, taking on, you know, modestly more debt and kind of building up the equity value of the company, in which case you could see a lot of upside um, longer term. So that's, you know, that's kind of the, the pitch in a nutshell. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you said that uh, institutional investors typically avoid closed end funds. Why is that? I think it's just because um, I don't know if you're if you're being paid. I mean, closed end funds, first of all, charge a management fee. So essentially, if you're a professional investor, you're charging your client a management fee and then you're investing in a closed end fund who's also charging a management fee. You know, it just doesn't. Um, it probably isn't going to sit well with the underlying with the underlying client, and probably as a professional investor, you just want to you know pick and choose the securities that, that you want to invest in, or and in, get market exposure through an ETF, you know, for basically you know one or two basis points. So that's that's kind of the, the biggest the biggest reason. Um, but the nice thing is with REITs, there's a lot of interest from from individual investors, and also there's a lot of REIT ETFs, and so um, I expect that once you know, this conversion takes place. There's no guarantee that it will. I think, I think it will. Um, we could see some nice, um, you know, index buying, you know, 20% of, of the shares could be basically locked up by um, passive investors, which would be a nice, would probably give the stock a nice boost. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds really interesting. And uh, for a uh, concluding question, which events have been most influential in your investing career? Let's see um, what events have been most um, influential in my investing career. So I would say, um, so the big, the big one was um, one of the, you know, just in no particular order, I guess. So Liberated Syndication was the first spinoff that I really made a lot of money on. You know, I, I sized that up um, and made a lot of money. And it was, um, I, I kind of thought, you know, starting at Eden Vance, I kind of thought, you could invest in growth stocks that trade at really high multiples, or you could invest in value stocks, which weren't, you know, traded at more reasonable PEs, not dirt cheap, weren't growing that, that crazy, but it was kind of like either or. And the cool thing about Liberated Syndication was like, this was a company that was a, you know, pure play podcast hosting company growing at 25%, trading at three times earnings. It was just, it was either a fraud and I did a lot of work to, to um, get comfortable that it wasn't a fraud, or it was a really, really interesting, uh, incredible opportunity. And so um, that really opened my eyes that, you know, you kind of, even if I don't believe in the efficient market hypothesis, you kind of think, oh, things are probably, you know, too good to be true. Um, that's probably not really an opportunity. That doesn't really exist. You can't buy a company at two times earnings, three times earnings, it's growing. And so that kind of opened my eyes that actually you can. And, um, you know, even in the U.S., which is a really efficient market, you find these interesting opportunities, like with BBX Capital, you know, trading at 50% of, of cash, um, generating positive free cash flow, um, situations that you wouldn't think would exist with the efficient market hypothesis that kind of opened my eyes to um, just kind of the opportunity that there is in kind of the, the smaller niches of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. This has been a tremendous session and we really appreciate you uh, taking the time and effort schedule to be with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay, bye.